What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Nicholas. That is Noah at FB God on Twitter. This is Big Dogs Got to Eat BDGE Fantasy Football. As always, every single Wednesday, we're giving you our top trade targets in fantasy football. Some sell highs, some buy lows, and some other nonsense going on around the NFL. Um, maybe guys that are coming off bad weeks or coming off of really big weeks. We got the trade deadline coming up for the actual NFL season next Tuesday, so six days from when you're watching this, October 29th, 4 p.m. Eastern time. We've had some uh, some trades go down already this week that are kind of affecting the landscape, so we'll break down all of that and more in our in our top trade targets for the week. What's cracking, Noah? How we doing? We're doing well. Some crazy news. Right before we recorded, Kerryon Johnson got put on the IR. Emmanuel Sanders got shipped out. Mohamed Sanu apparently is like Julio Jones reincarnate, so a lot of things are going on right now. The league is shaking up, and so is fantasy football as a whole. Yeah, it's getting uh, it's getting interesting now, especially gearing up towards the playoffs. If you don't have depth on your team, you are booked with these bye weeks. Not a big uh, bye week week, particularly for this one, though. I think it's only two teams on the bye week. What do we have? Dallas and uh, I'm not sure at all. I forget what the other team is, but these other people can figure it out. I'm sure they know by now. Uh, you ready to talk trade targets? Of course. All right, let's get it. Hit that intro. All right, our first sell high of the video today is me a quarterback for the Buffalo Bills, and it's Josh Allen. And it's kind of a different approach to this because I'm only recommending him as a sell high if you are pretty much a lock to make the playoffs. Like if you're 7-0, and 6-1, and 5-2, and two, something like that, that's the only way I would really sell him because if you look at his upcoming schedule, right, he plays Philadelphia, Washington, Cleveland, Miami over his next four. Those are four of the best matchups you could hope for out of a quarterback to return near QB1 value. Um, but after that, right, weeks 12 through 16, when you're trying to make that final push towards your playoffs, Denver at Dallas, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, New England. Those are very tough just looking at both their coverage grade and their fantasy points allowed to the position. And the reason I say to ship them off if you're winning is because if you can afford to give up a few of those boom or potential boom weeks um, over the next four, if you have a guy like Jacoby Brissett or like a Lamar Jackson or somebody like that who you can fill in because you might have just picked up Josh Allen off of waivers, um, I would definitely ship him out for like a skill position guy. Or even if you want to ship him out for a quarterback like Kyler Murray coming off of a bad game, I wouldn't hate that. Just somebody who has a better schedule down the stretch as opposed to getting these next three or four wins on the back of Allen and then having to struggle down the stretch. And another reason why I'm not like super, I'm not super high on him. Um, these next coming games is we've seen him thus far play a bunch of pretty terrible defenses, right? He's played the giants. He's played the jets. He's played Cincinnati and he played Miami last week. And despite that he's finished as a top 12 quarterback only once. And I know every week that he gets these matchups, people put him in like the top five, the top six as having that upside because you know, he's that Russian quarterback who has those big plays, but that really hasn't been who he is thus far this season. I know on a point per game basis, he's a QB one, but he's only finished in that range once. And it's mostly due to him not being that much of a rushing factor or as much as he was last year. Um, last season, he had four games over 90 rushing yards. This year, he only has one game over 40 rushing yards. And I think that's a combination of him having, you know, more time to throw behind that offensive line, having more weapons and having an actual running game in Buffalo. So I don't think his upside is as high as people may think over these next four weeks, which is why I'd, I'd sell him if you're in a position of like, you're going to win these next four games, uh, even without him. But if you are in need, I would, I would try to buy in him, which, you know, if you, if you do that equation out, it means he's a good sell high because there's a market for him right now. Yeah. Uh, I would, I would probably disagree with you there. I just think that the schedule right now is, is too good for Allen. Like if you're in a position to trade Allen, you're probably in like a one quarterback league and you've been streaming him. And I mean, streaming quarterbacks is easy in theory, but a lot of the times you end up picking up a quarterback and they go for like 14 or 15. I just think Allen over the next, you know, four or five weeks, uh, his schedule with Philly, Washington, Cleveland, Miami, Denver's been okay, but not fantastic. I, I just think he's got like four or five 20 point games there for you. So I would probably take him because I, I mean, again, if you're streaming, that means that when you do come to that playoff time, when the when the schedule gets tougher, when they play at Pittsburgh, at New England, obviously you're not going to want to play them. There are a lot of guys available on the waiver that have really intriguing um, week 15 and 16 matchups. Like Stafford plays at home against Tampa Bay in week 15. 
And then we have uh, – I know Brissette James- gets pretty good games down the stretch. I think week 16 is tough, but up to that, it's pretty good. Yeah, I think, I think like, if you're just progressive about it, like, look at Josh Allen's matchups. You can't play him 15 or 16, but just start looking ahead to other guys that are streamable options. Like, even Daniel Jones, he plays at home against Miami week 15. Then he plays against the Redskins in week 16. So if you could, you know, um, this is the time of the year. It's, it's tough to stash with bye weeks coming up. But, like, if you have your starting lineup set and you have, like, one extra guy at each position where you know they'll be able to fill in during those bye weeks and you have room for a second or third quarterback, it's a little early in the season to probably stash this far ahead. But in the upcoming weeks, when you hit weeks 10, 11, if you have to stash, like, two or three weeks out to make sure that you have a pristine matchup for a quarterback, I would be okay doing that. So I probably wouldn't sell Allen, but I get – in theory, it definitely makes sense given that you're not even going to be able to um, use him for the playoffs, basically. Yeah, I agree with that philosophy that you brought up. I just think if you have, like, a quarterback that you know you can rely on, like a Lamar Jackson, and you happen to pick Allen off the bye and, like, all these fantasy outlets are talking about his upcoming schedule being as good as it, as good as it is, um, I think you could probably flip him for somebody that would help your team in other aspects. But, yeah, over these next four weeks, if you need wins, I have no problem holding on to him or even acquiring him if somebody's selling him in your league. Yeah. Um, another guy that I'm I'm trying to sell right now is one of the more intriguing storylines of this – weekend was the Cardinals backfield because David Johnson was active ended up playing like two or three snaps and it was a Chase Edmonds show uh, that being said David Johnson's been utilized a lot in the passing game this year and his numbers have been good fantasy wise I'm trying to sell him right now for any Cliff Kingsbury is too <laughs> very very factual so if the coach is trying to sell him you should coach your fantasy team the same way because he's not going to be using him down the stretch the same way that we've seen him in the beginning of the year He's a very, 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 very prestigious sell-high candidate. He was a first-round pick, and you could probably continue to sell him on name value alone. People are like, oh, you know what? He's hurt. He's banged up or whatever. He'll come back and be the David Johnson of old. He's dealing with his back injury. He's dealing with this ankle injury, too. So we don't really know what's going on with the injury, but obviously he's uh, far away from being 100%. Cliff told us on Friday that if he had played or if they had played that day, that Johnson would not have suited up. So it tells you that he's a little bit far off from actually getting back on the field. Johnson has been terrible as a running back this year. Like, as a pure runner, he's been very bad. And I went back to all of his fantasy games, and I'm looking at his rushing production on the year. And in terms of fantasy points, he has given you just six points per game fantasy-wise from his rushing production. So yards and touchdowns, six points per game. He is uh, the 24th graded running back for PFF. In terms of elusiveness, 48th out of 50 qualified running backs. Only Sonny Michelle and John Hilleman are worse And in terms of his evaded tackles per rush attempt, he is dead last in the NFL. This is basically going on two years now because I I talked about it a lot this offseason, how I thought Edmonds was the more explosive back last year. David Johnson, his subjective numbers, just looking at, you know, elusiveness and breakaway runs and things like that were awful last year. And all the pushback I got was like, oh, well, their offensive line was terrible and like he's getting hit in the backfield every time. So there's nothing he can do. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'll probably give him the benefit of the doubt and say that that's the case here. But now we're going on a second season in which we're still seeing him rank out as one of the least elusive running backs in the NFL. Now, he's still very, very good in the passing game, of course. He's getting a lot of receptions, running a lot of routes out of the slot, um, and he's getting the goal line carries here. And is his offensive line, you know, we blame the offensive line last year, and is it still to blame this year? Sure, a little bit, but it's not getting any better. So the situation for David Johnson isn't getting better. And we saw Chase Edmonds um, succeed and have by far – in a way, the best rushing performance of any Cardinals running back so far this year. So the way I see it, it's like you have the injuries. You have him just not being that good of a running back. He's not elusive. He still has burst, obviously, when you get him in space and open up holes. But how often is this offensive line opening up holes? Edmonds' fantasy value is obviously tethered. This isn't like, oh, my God, I think Chase Edmonds outright takes the role. He's still the backup. It's still David Johnson's backfield for now. But Edmonds' value is tethered to Johnson's availability. Um, He's not going to push a starting job. But he has, like, after these last three weeks, he's been super, super efficient, especially this last week where he operated as the workhorse against the Giants. Like, he he has absolutely earned a bigger role in this offense. He's been more efficient. He's been more explosive. He's just been the better runner. And he shows a skill set that's capable on all three downs. So, look at DJ. He is dependent on his passing game usage when we talk about fantasy football. And we have Christian Kirk, who is probably coming back this week, if not next week at the very latest. Um, So, that probably means – as someone who ran 76% of his snaps from the slot so far this year, like David Johnson is going to take a backseat to those underneath um, routes, or at least, you know, 
it'll come down a little bit because we've seen him get so many dump offs. But I think Christian Kirk obviously coming back gives Kyler Murray another reliable option to throw to because they've had nothing behind Fitz and Kirk in this passing game. And Fitz really hasn't done shit since uh, Kirk has gone out. So I think that, you know, hinders David Johnson's workload a little bit. Then you look at the upcoming schedule, right? It is really, really, really tough. And I tweeted this out talking about Chase Edmonds, but obviously it holds true for David Johnson as well. They play at New Orleans, San Francisco, at Tampa Bay, at San Francisco. These are probably the single four best run defenses in the entire NFL. All of them are very, 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 very good. They have their buy in week 12, so you can't use them. They play the Rams and the Pittsburgh right after that, who aren't elite, but they're also not like pushover run defenses. Pittsburgh has yet to allow in, uh, a running back to run for more than 68 yards in a game this year. And they're a defense that always progressively gets better as the season goes by because they have good coaching and you know, they tend to uh, be able to figure out what changes they need to make on that side of the ball. Then they play at Seattle in the championship week, and they've been quietly very, very good against the run this year. So you look at, you know, David Johnson, he's not going to be efficient running the ball against these defenses. And you might, you might need to, like, bank on a rushing touchdown, but they're not always on the goal line. And you have a guy like Kyler Murray who also takes away carries when they're down inside the five, inside the 10-yard line. Just, just a lot of red flags here. And if you could still sell David Johnson on his name value, I would do so. Yeah, if David Johnson didn't have the name or the contract that he has, it would be Edmund's job by now. Because over the past two years, as you said, he has looked so much better than David Johnson. Even in the passing game, I know in college, I know he went to Fordham, it's a pretty small school, but like he was used in the passing game and he's so explosive he's so explosive and elusive in the open field. I don't see how like even with David Johnson healthy, that he doesn't get like a five to ten percent like touch uptick, especially if David Johnson's a little bit hobbled. And yeah. I think it's gonna be like a Stefan Diggs situation upcoming where like if he's on the injury report at all in these next few weeks, I'm not sure if you can trust him to go out there and just get a workhorse role because we saw this past week where, you know, he wasn't expected to play like if they had a game on Friday. Um, and then they said that he was going to be ready on Sunday. And then after the game, they said like it was an emergency situation, but he got the first touch. Like nothing made sense there. So I don't, I don't see how you could ever really trust him. I know he's still going to probably be like a back end RB1 through passing usage alone, but I'm just trying to avoid all these situations with not only a bad schedule, but uh, injuries looming overhead of David Johnson. Yeah, I mean, looking at the, the games coming up, I mean, if, you, if you're someone who had David Johnson and you handcuffed him with Chase Edmonds, like, good on you. This is such a tough matchup at New Orleans. Uh, if I'm playing one of them, it's going to be Chase Edmonds, over, Chase Edmonds over David Johnson. We also, like, didn't mention that they were working out veteran running backs this week as well, Spencer Ware, J.A. Jai. So that tells you that, you know, they're worried about David Johnson's health. They need depth in that backfield. Uh, so – that doesn't look good for Dave Johnson's upcoming um, upcoming schedule, I guess. And if they're both active, I still think Chase Edmonds gets at least 50% of the work in this, in this next game, if not the next two games. And on just a par for par level, like Chase Edmonds has been far more efficient. So if they're both getting the same touch load, I'll probably take Edmonds a hundred percent healthy Edmonds over um, someone who's obviously ailing and has a few injuries that he's dealing with in David Johnson. Yeah. And they actually had like diversified runs. Like they were running draw plays and stuff. Like I haven't seen David Johnson take a draw play for more than like one and a half yards in maybe four years. Cause like he's, Chase, so, he's just not elusive. And like, when you take draw plays, like you have to be able to see the line, make really good cuts and, and then burst through the line. Like if you're running from under center, you know, you get those few extra steps to fucking burst through, but the, the line just doesn't let him do that. And Chase Edmonds is, I mean, he's proven to be a workhorse before he was that guy in college. And if you were like in any dynasty leagues, he's obviously been on your radar, read, radar for a few years. So now you're ready to roll with him. Yeah, try to sell him for a guy like Marlon Mack coming off a down week. Uh, Joe Mixon's a little bit too far of a step down, but yeah. you know somebody like Mack, maybe even like a Derrick Henry, if that owner wants to part ways. And I know that's a lot coming from me, but yeah, I'm I'm all out on David Johnson rest of the season. Yeah, and I have a I, I'm in a dynasty league where I'm seven and zero right now, and um, my running backs are David Johnson and Carry On Johnson, and I'm about to go from like I might miss the fucking playoffs right now because of this nonsense i'm six so, and one and i had geis and carry on johnson so geez uh, how did i have cmc i have mccaffrey so oh you want to you want to just throw that <laughs> in there yeah those are my two starting guys yeah another elite player we're going to talk about um keenan allen wide receiver los An los angeles chargers he's a buy low and this might just be like wishful thinking uh on my part because i'm a chargers fan and they are absolutely terrible but everything he's done this past month makes him a prime buy low candidate because one, his price right now is that of probably like a low end to mid wide receiver two, because over his past four weeks, he's averaged less than four catches and 40 yards receiving. And, but on top of that, right, he's had terrible games, 
the thing you want to do when you're buying low on somebody is look at the opportunities they're getting. And right now he is, I think, fourth in the league in targets. I'm not sure if Julian Edelman surpassed him last night, um, but he has 70 targets on the season, so that's 10 a game. He is tied for first with red zone targets with nine. Uh, he's in the top 25 in deep targets, and he's number one in air yards in the NFL. So despite him not producing, and I know he racked up a ton of these stats in the early weeks, um, he's still being used, and that was evident last game. He had 11 targets against a pretty good Tennessee Titans defense. And these past couple of weeks when they played like Denver and uh, Pittsburgh, and when they just played Tennessee, they like always put a linebacker near him, and then they have like safety help because he works in the short and intermediate game, so they kind of bracket him to limit him. With Hunter Henry coming back and with them going to have to use Austin Eckler upcoming because, one, Melvin Gordon has looked awful. Bro, can we like can we talk about this Chargers offense? They're they're going out of their way to like. How do they not realize this? Like them forcing the ball to Melvin Gordon up the middle is ruining their entire offense. Like they were so much more efficient when it was just Eckler there, and they just decided to pass the ball at a rate of seventy percent. Like there's no reason for them to just force fucking Gordon to carry the ball eighteen times a game inefficiently. It was so much more opened up. I remember in the preseason, we were talking about how much we liked Eckler because you could see how open this offense was. Like they were, like the times that they were throwing or uh, rushing it with Eckler, it was like outside plays, it was pitch plays, and they were using them out in space. Melvin Gordon, every single rush has just been one of, like a rush up the middle, yeah. despite them having their second string center and their third string left tackle. Well, now they're going to have their third string left tackle with Forrest Lampert. They have nothing on the offensive line, but they are getting their left tackle back. And since they have nothing up the middle in terms of guard and center play, I think this is going to skew a little bit more pass heavy, especially with Melvin Gordon just looking as terrible as he had. So with Keenan Allen getting the targets and the usage he's had and them having to, you know, with their, with their defense right now, they're going to have to throw a bit more because they're getting blown out by teams that heading into the season, you wouldn't think would keep this game within like 15 points or 14 points is a football number. So we'll go with that. But like, (laughs) <laughs> they've they've been so bad on both sides of the ball and both their cornerbacks like the only guys that were healthy apart from Joey Bosa um and Desmond King and Casey Hayward went down with injuries and they came back but they literally have nothing on the defensive end they're gonna have to throw and if Phil have, has a little bit more time with Russell Kuhn coming back from injury either like this week or next week or sometime soon um and Keenan still being their number one target I think he can return a little bit more value than what you're gonna have to pay for him right now and looking at his upcoming schedule if you want to buy him after this week, because they're playing Chicago and Chicago is going to absolutely destroy them, especially if Okung is out. Um, after that, he gets Green Bay, Oakland, Kansas City. Uh, Denver is tough, but then Jacksonville, Minnesota, who just gave up four touchdowns to Marvin Jones and uh, the Raiders. He has a really good schedule after that. And I know Green Bay is pretty good, but those are games that they're going to have to throw because those offenses can put up points. Um, and he's going to be a recipient of a bunch of targets and if you're chasing one thing in fantasy football, it's opportunity, and that's exactly what Keenan Allen's going to give you right now. Yeah, I think you're just also hoping that the Chargers coaching staff realizes, you know, what we've kind of just been mentioning and how they need to get away from the run, up, like, or get a little bit more creative rather than just trying to run up the middle every time and start going more pass heavy. I can't imagine them watching film and just seeing uh, what a shit show that's been for them. So uh, I'm definitely on board with buying Keenan Allen very low. I'm not sure how – um, how low you'll be able to actually get him for. Because if you are a Keenan Allen owner, obviously you're going to be hoping and praying that he gets – like you remember those first three weeks when he was single-handedly like winning you your fantasy games. So you're still excited about that, but you're right. It's been a long time. It's been four straight games of absolute dud games for, uh, for Keenan Allen. So if there's a time to strike, now would probably be it before he starts having a little bit more uh, boom in his game and they start going a little bit more pass-heavy. Yeah, I actually just traded him in my home league, and it's going to probably sound like a smash trade, but I gave up Keenan Allen. I actually traded him away. I gave up Keenan Allen and Jason Witten for Zach Ertz and Tyreek Hill. So Ooh, that's that's interesting. Um, it's because I'm I'm 5-2 and two right now, and I feel like I can weather the storm without Mahomes in there. I'm but. nervous about the whole Mahomes thing. Like, I have no idea what's going to happen there. They, you know, they keep saying, like, it's less and less each time. They're more optimistic about it, but I I don't know if they're going to rush him back. But I mean, then again, then again, they've been pretty truthful in terms of like uh, health wise, like with Terry kill, we kind of heard the same sentiment and then he ended up coming back in week six. So uh, and I guess we have a little bit of credibility to kind of trust with, with Andy Reed here. But um, I mean, yeah, if, if Mahomes is back within like a two week range, then obviously you, you won that trade because Terry kills by far and away the best player there. Yeah. They shouldn't rush him back. I mean, they're in the AFC West and I'm pretty sure Oakland's in first place right now. So even if he comes back for those last four weeks, I don't see how they don't win that division. Oakland's in first place. I'm pretty sure. I mean, the Chargers suck. 
Yeah, I mean, well, I wasn't expecting the Chargers. Yeah, Ken- well, Kansas City's dropped. Yeah. Haven't they lost their last three? Uh, no, they won last week against Denver because they killed them. And then oh yeah, on Thursday night. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, so they're five and they're five and two. They got to be a hit. Uh, I don't think the Raiders have won five games. More yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah Ty- Tyree Kill. I, he's someone that. I was like, I, I have him in my, in my big money league. I have him and DeAndre Hopkins. So I was like, oh, my God, I can't wait to have Tyree Kill back so I can have someone who puts up more than six points a game, get him back. Then Mahomes gets hurt. But now Will Fuller's hurt. So, you know, maybe DeAndre Hopkins can, can be fucking mature and grow up and start scoring me some fantasy points. I think that's going to happen now with Will Fuller's, uh, Will Fuller's injury. Um, so going back to some of the trades that happened, let, let's actually discuss some of those trades before we go into my last buy low guy. So we had Mohamed Sanu go to the Patriots. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Because for me, it seems like, um, you know, we don't question what the Patriots do, but a second round, we won't go into the whole prices of of the trades. They give up a second rounder, which seems like a a hefty move. Um, But Mohamed Tanu is just a super reliable receiver. He's someone that I could absolutely see. It's almost like a a Philip Dorsett, but like a little bit more of an upgrade. Because, I mean, Dorsett, don't get me wrong, they're completely different players. But you look at Dorsett and a lot of people will be like, yeah, he's a gadget guy. He's a really quick speed guy. But they use all their receivers almost in the same way. Like, they don't use Philip Dorsett in a way that makes you think of, like, Percy Harvin or anything like that. He's just another wide receiver in the cog. So it seems like Mohamed Sanu kind of fits right in there. Also says something about Josh Gordon probably. Maybe his knee injury is a little bit more serious than we had uh, imagined. I mean, Julian Edelman, I, I don't think he's really banged up anymore. But they don't have a lot of depth there. Um, so with Mohamed Sanu, it's not a guy that I'm getting ready to, like, throw into my lineup. But I could totally see him being on one of our, like, waiver wire pickup videos within the next like couple weeks yeah I think in like a full PPR league he can give you like decent flex value just because that offense is predicated on short quick throws and that's what he's going to do he's just going to get open quick for you um I think he's like a very good player in real life a second round pick seems a bit hefty but Bill knows what he's doing I was actually hoping Emmanuel Sanders would go there because he's basically like 85 percent of what Antonio Brown was and I thought he'd be a perfect fit there and he's now in San Francisco but I think it's a good move for the Patriots in terms of getting more weapons but the next guy we're going to talk about, I think it, it's a major bump to him. Yeah, I mean, like that makes – I mean, Jacoby Myers is obviously the odd man out there, but it also puts, you know, Dorsett or Josh Gordon in a weird position when Gordon comes back because on two wide receiver sets, who is the who's the odd man out? I guess it's Edelman, Gordon, and I doubt they sit Sanu. It's probably just like – I feel like Sanu is just such a consistent player and he's like a good – off the field, like character guy, he just fits into the Patriots system so well that they're. I they they were saying reports that like they've been trying to move a second rounder for Sanu since the NFL draft. So now that the Falcons are like kind of tanking and they have nothing going for them, they're like, you know what, we could just recruit our second. Uh, we can recruit that second round pick that they offered originally, um, and I guess just take what we can get for Sanu. But that leads us to my other buy low candidate, that is Calvin Ridley of the Atlanta Falcons. Now he obviously gets a boost when it comes to Mohamed Sanu moving out of Atlanta. Uh, he's been inconsistent this year. Same thing as last year where we had his boom games and then he's had a lot of bad games. If you look at his rookie season numbers, 92 targets, 64 receptions, 821 yards, 10 touchdowns. If you pace out what he's done so far this year, 100 targets, 66 receptions, 852 yards, 9.1 touchdowns, almost identical number. Now with Sanu being moved, <clears throat> that's going to open up a lot more play time for Ridley. Now, a lot of people probably assume that Ridley had already been the wide receiver too and running the most snaps. He had actually played third fiddle in this offense to Julio and Sanu. Sanu has been the snap leader among the Atlanta wide receivers in every single game this year. He tied Julio for the most snaps in two out of the seven, but every other game, five out of the other seven games, Sanu has ran, has been on the field for the most snaps out of all the wide receivers there. Ridley was third. Ridley has been third in snaps and uh, has run the third most routes out of these three wide receivers. Now they're down to two, obviously. It'll be interesting to see where they start lining Ridley up or where they start lining Julio up, too, um, because Sanu had been primarily a slot receiver. He'd run like 80, 80, 75 to 80% of his routes from the slot, whereas Ridley and Julio are obviously dominant outside receivers. Um, but when you look at the offense overall, Ryan has attempted 285 passes this year, which is on pace for 652 on the season. That would be a career high. This defense isn't getting any better. This run game is horrible and isn't getting any better. So that outcome in which he throws for a career high in pass attempts is very likely to happen under Dirk Cutter. Now, Ridley currently ranks 12th among NFL wide receivers in quarterback rating when targeted, 7th in target separation, and 6th overall in deep targets. So as, you know, as I guess disappointing as his numbers have been so far, he hasn't been bad. There's just been a lot of like randomness that's happened in this offense that has 
kind of led to uh, a mediocre year compared to where the step up that we assumed was going to happen. But with uh, Muhammad Sanu being out, Ridley's going to have, you know, he's going to see an increase in snap counts by probably like 10 to 15%, which if you increase his production by 10 to 15%, that translates into another touchdown or two, another 100 to 150 receiving yards for the rest of the year. Um, obviously, Matt Ryan is a little banged up with the ankle. It's not supposed to be serious right now, but uh, they're not really playing for anything. And they do have a bye in week nine after they play Seattle this week. So I wouldn't be surprised if they sat Ryan this week, had the bye. And then when they return from their bye, uh, they have a really, really pass friendly schedule. They actually play of their next five games. Every one of them is an NFC South opponent. It's at New Orleans, at Carolina, Tampa Bay, New Orleans, Carolina. Now, if you look at the fantasy points allowed to wide receivers, all of them are very, 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 very friendly. So you look at, they play the Saints twice. So Marshawn Lattimore will probably shadow Julio. The Panthers will probably do the same thing with Bradbury on Julio. I think there are going to be a lot of big games coming for Ridley. Um, obviously, the week 15 and 16 is a little tough. San Francisco is a very tough matchup. Jacksonville's not anywhere near as scary without Jalen Ramsey there. But I think you have a few different buy low windows over the next you know, two to three weeks. You have right now where Ridley's just kind of been struggling and been mediocre. You have uh, after this week, if Matt Ryan sits, and he's probably not going to do that well with the backup quarterback. Or you have after – um, after that week, you have a buy in which maybe the owner doesn't want to hold on to Ridley after, you know, like four or five games of mediocre play. So I think uh, not necessarily buying right now, but you can go for maybe a trade right now. Or if you want to hold out and be a little bit more risky over the next week or two, uh, I think there are going to be multiple buy opportunities for a guy like Calvin Ridley. Yeah, I remember the first trade target video we put out like weeks one through four. I had Calvin Ridley on there because if you looked at Mohamed Sanu's contract, the Falcons, I believe, could cut him after this year for like a $1 million or $1 million worth of uh, dead cap or whatever. So I was mm-hmm. expecting him to get a bigger role. Now it's inevitable with Sanu out of the situation. And also because those games against the NFC South, and I know these defenses, like each and every one, maybe not Tampa Bay, has improved against the pass this year. Um, but if you look at the, uh, Calvin Ridley's stats against the division last year, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was something like an average of like 90 receiving yards, 1.2 touchdowns. And his pace was like 1400 yards and a couple touchdowns or like double digit touchdowns, just playing those opponents. And it was obviously a pretty big sample size, a six game sample as a rookie. So yeah, with these upcoming schedule, with this upcoming schedule and him getting more looks and an offense is going to have to throw the ball after Devonta Freeman just got put in a baby carriage by Aaron Donald. Like this is, (laughs) he's a prime by low who I could see like easily being like on that wide receiver two, three borderline, like a top 24 play on a weekly basis, especially with those matchups upcoming. Yeah, he had felt like a like a must-start player in the beginning of the year after the first couple of games. I thought he was like a setter, forget it, fantasy wide receiver. And I'm someone who owns him. I own him in the uh, Big Dogs League that we have. And he's been like pretty disappointing for me, unfortunately. But like, yeah, like you said, against the NFC South opponents, I'm looking at his game logs from last year. Carolina, four for 64 and a touchdown. New Orleans, seven for 146, three touchdowns. Uh, New Orleans, again, eight for 93 in a touchdown. Carolina, three for 90 in a touchdown. Tampa Bay, five for 32 in a touchdown. So it's like all but one game where he went three for 47 against Tampa Bay. That like game he, he left off. after the first quarter, too. I remember that thing. Remember yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. That makes sense now. So every other game against the NFC South was absolute smash spot. So if Matt Ryan can get healthy, return after the bye, and have those five games on his schedule, I think we're going to see like a huge streak from Midley given the increase, the increase in – um, in playtime and just uh, the matchups that Julio Jones is going to have. So uh, Ridley is a prime buy low candidate over the next week or so. Another buy low. Our last one on this list is DK Metcalf of the Seattle Seahawks. And I know last week you were all over Metcalf being like a big um, waiver wire pickup because of Will Disley going down. And we saw that come to fruition, not production wise, but opportunity wise. He had nine targets last week, very quietly. Two of those came in the red zone. So it's no secret that Russell Wilson wants to use him both deep down the field in the red zone and I have like the next gen stats route chart coming into the year like the common theme like surrounding DK Metcalf was he can run two routes he can run a go and he can run a comeback if you look at the route chart right it's mostly on the left side of the field I get that he has some limitations but he's been used over the middle of the field he's been obviously used deep and he's been used in the red zone because he is like a 6'4 legit like 230 pounds of like pure muscle it's like I don't even know what he's built like he's built like Aaron Donald it's crazy but He's had nine who reds. Think, who do you think would be better, Aaron Donald as a wide receiver or DK Metcalf as a as a nose tackle? I feel like Aaron Donald, low key, is super fucking freakishly athletic. He'd probably be a baller wide receiver on a screenplay. He might just take like eighty yards to the house every single play. I feel like he would. Yeah, like he'd be Julian Edelman, like just a, a lot thicker. 
He's like Mark Ingram on a workout plan. We, <laughs> we need to see Donald on the offensive side. Honestly, the Rams could probably use that right about now. They really could at quarterback too. <laughs> but with with, DK, <laughs> with DK Metcalf, right? He's seen nine red zone targets this year, which is number one in the league. Nick, take a guess at how many he's caught. Zero. Zero. There's I'm gonna so be. Good at, I'm so good at guessing when you ask me those questions. Yeah, and reading. <laughs> <laughs> So there's, there's hopefully and probably going to be some regression there where he comes down with one or two of those. Uh, I think half of them or like four or five of them have come inside the 10-yard line. So it's not like he's just using him at the 20-yard line and throwing him to the 15. Like they're using him in and around the end zone. And as those touchdowns come up and as those deep balls start to connect a little bit more, like I know he's caught, I think he has 10 deep targets and he's caught five of them. With mm-hmm. Russell Wilson being as accurate as he is and with him being like the only legit Actually, that's, a, that's fake news. He's not the only legit weapon on this team. But the only like, legit big weapon on this team who has really shown he can win deep down the field. Okay, well, he leads the team in market share of air yards, which is surprising given that Tyler Lockett's the other guy and he's someone who succeeds down the field. I almost look at DK Metcalf as a guy you could – he's like Calvin Ridley, right? He's like the number two on the team, and he could explode over this kind of second half of the year because he's getting the opportunity. It just hasn't come into production. So I feel like he's a cheaper version of what you can get from Calvin Ridley tied to – uh, a more efficient quarterback. Obviously, Matt Ryan's very good, but DK and Russell Wilson is historically elite when it comes to accuracy down the field and everything like that. So when I look at DK Metcalf, like you said, I mean, he leads the NFL in red zone targets. He leads the NFL in end zone targets as well. And those are the most valuable targets you're going to get. And with Will Disley out, like obviously it's an increase to DK Metcalf and, the, and how they're going to use him and just the overall usage that he's going to get. He's already been running about 90% of uh, the team's snaps already. So he's on the field as much as any full-time wide receiver is I am a little bit nervous about how this is going to affect the offense overall and Russell Wilson because it seemed like Will Disley became a security blanket for him and I don't know how well the the offense is going to move in terms of like smoothness and being able to uh, move the chains as we saw over like the first month and month and a half of the season and they obviously didn't look very good in um, in their in this last game which they lost but uh, DK Metcalf I mean he's just getting all of the valuable targets and every single time he has a bad game like he becomes a buy low candidate because eventually he's going to connect on some of these uh, deep balls or some of these end zone throws and the numbers are there the production just isn't yet but it's almost a uh, it almost has to come given his usage yeah and the price you're paying for him isn't that of like what you're going to need to give up to get Calvin Ridley right you're going to probably yeah. like if you have Muhammad Sanu you could probably flip him for DK Metcalf And I would 100% take DK Metcalf because we know his role in this offense, right? It's not like we're buying him on pure potential. We've seen him produce. In four of six games, he's either put up 65 yards or a touchdown. And with his upcoming schedule, in weeks 8, 9, and 12, he has three of possibly the easiest and most favorable matchups to pass the ball because not only are Atlanta, Tampa Bay, and Philly terrible against the pass, Tampa Bay and Philly are very good against the run. They're going to be funneling towards the pass. DK Metcalf is going to be heavily targeted. And if you look at players in these weeks that are on by, like somebody that you could, like if you traded Mohamed Sanu and you have one of these players, DK Metcalf could be a very good flex play for you because Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs, Keenan Allen, Tyreek Hill, Fitzgerald, Julio, Tyler Boyd, the Rams receivers, Michael Thomas, Amari Cooper, all those guys are on by in one of those weeks where DK Metcalf has a really good uh, matchup. So if you have one of these guys and you're looking ahead and you need a win um, and your team's a little bit weaker, but you can flip somebody like a Sanu, for DK Metcalf and play them in that spot. Uh, I think for that price, he's definitely worth paying for. Yeah, I, we'll, we'll be looking at Metcalf in such a different light if he just capitalizes on some of those end zone throws. Because if you had sprinkled in like another touchdown here in like week three or and then again in like week seven, in which totally not like unreasonable, just throw that in there, given the fact that he leads the NFL and those end zone targets, like you're looking at Metcalf as like a very solid weekly flex play. So um, if you're getting him now, you've already gotten past all of the unlucky weeks in which he didn't capitalize on those targets. And he's someone that you could uh, definitely throw into the flex conversation. Now, we just had uh, another piece of news break. I don't know how oh, fucking no. important it is, but the Lions have signed a uh, – oh, no, the Cardinals have signed a veteran running back. You want to guess who it is? J.J. No, I knew that was going to be your first. It's not Spencer Ware or J.J. C.J. Anderson. No. The Lions are fucking prying him away with like a six point <laughs> five million dollar contract, most likely. Fifth round pick. Uh, used you to know play for the Cowboys. What happened? Used to play for the Cowboys. No. Is it Alfred Morris? 
It's Alf. It's Alf the God Morris. <laughs> rest, rest in peace, David Johnson. Why would you ever bring in Alfred Morris if David he's Johnson gonna is on his deathbed? He's going to be so bad. He's going to be so bad on the Cardinals. Like, you know how bad their offensive line is? It's going to be. He wasn't even that good behind Dallas's O line. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, he would rumble his way to like 4.4 yards per carry somehow. Behind this line, it's going to be miserable. So that should tell you. Uh, he actually might just look like David Johnson behind that line. <laughs> Very good point. But that should tell you about where. David Johnson's health is if they're out there signing a veteran running back right now. Um, And I don't think that really hurt. I mean, Alfred Morris is not a guy that fucking catches balls ever. So that doesn't hurt Chase Edmonds is receiving upside. Even if David Johnson is active, that doesn't eat into any of their receiving uh, workload really. Do you want to touch on Cortland Sutton a little bit, just like real quick? Yeah. I mean, Cortland Sutton now is the wide receiver one there in Denver because we have Sanders going over to the 49ers um Cortland Sutton was already basically ranking in the top 15 for like almost every statistical category for the wide receivers uh I'm not really sure how much this really like gives him a boost I think it'll probably get him an extra one to two targets a game but Sanders was a guy who was getting a lot of underneath routes he wasn't really getting too many deep targets anymore at least not connecting on a lot of them Um, and I feel like that's where Sutton's game has really developed and he's become a good downfield playmaker so I, I, obviously it's a little bit of a boost, but I think, you know, obviously it, it puts Deshaun Hamilton into the slot. I'm not buying in on that because, I mean, we've talked about Deshaun Hamilton before. He's a guy who catches like nine balls for 32 yards, and that's what you're going to get out of it. So if, maybe if you're in a full PPR league, you'll look at him as a deeper option. But um, I'm not too excited about the move for Sanders or the move for Deshaun Hamilton because Sanders goes to San Fran, but like that passing offense is – They're just running all game. Yeah, it, it's absolutely terrible. So I think, like, Sanders could be a flex option. Probably, I don't know. I, I look at Sanders almost the same way as I did when he was just in Denver. So I don't think it's a big upgrade or downgrade either way. But obviously Sutton gets a little bit of a volume boost. Yeah, I think Sutton gets a volume boost. But as a whole, I'm not sure how well this offense is going to move. Like, Emmanuel Sanders is a pretty big part of this offense just working underneath. And I think he was actually second in the league in red zone targets too. So they were using him in high-value situations. So obviously some of those will go towards Cortland Sutton. But with Flacco back there and Cortland Sutton – you know, maybe getting like bracketed every single game. I'm not sure I'd pay up to get him expecting him to be like a locked in top 10 option. Yeah. A lot of the times, like those guys who take the big step up, aren't ready to really be the alphas yet. I think this is probably a situation for Sutton. I think he'll do well. I think he'll continue to do really like what he's been doing so far, but as soon as you put him into the position where he needs to produce as the alpha or else the team suffers like immensely, it's not, he's not going to have games where like, Oh, if he can't take over, he can't beat the top cornerback. Like, Emmanuel Sanders can always step up and put up, you know, 100 yards receiving, eight receptions. He's not going to have that anymore. So he's going to need to be that guy, and defenses are obviously going to know that. So, uh, again, I think a little bit of a volume boost, but I'm not sure how much this really helps him in terms of efficiency. That is all we got today. That is our trade target video for week eight. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you're following both of us on Twitter. If you're new to the channel, smash that subscribe button. We're hitting you with fantasy football goodness six days a week, something like that. And we'll see you all on next week's Trade Target 